All right, let's bring the same exact energy into worship too. This is awesome. Got me all hyped up too. All right, which, which one of the kids has all the sugar? Yeah. All right, <laughs> let's stand in worship. Let's stand in worship. So as we sing this worship this morning and, and for the message, just prepare your hearts to know that God is in control. You know, there, there's giants in our way, there are trials in our way, there's massacres going on in other countries. Some of our brothers and sisters, uh, if you talk to them, can tell you firsthand about tragedies in other countries, and God has a way of working them all out. So let's sing, Every Giant Will Fall. Here we go.
together to proclaim that love and worship you for all that you are.
faces that we worship you with. We thank you, Lord, that we are able to sing and to lift our hands and to worship you. Lord, you, you call us to come. Lord, all through your word, you say come. If you're thirsty, come. So Lord, I just pray today as we open up your word, as we read, as we study, I pray that those that are thirsty here would find the truth of refreshment that comes only from you. So Lord, please meet with us here right now, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, guys. Well, um, those of you that uh, don't know, I've already preached this message uh, about an hour ago. Um, so it was, it was interesting and nice to be able to uh, uh, return the favor that Mark gave me last week. He's on vacation this week, so I preached at their church and he preached at our church. Last. It's, it's all a good thing. Um, so, are you guys looking forward to Church at the Beach? Yeah. I am. Um, uh, yeah. So remember, what, what day is it? August what? 8th. What time are we supposed to be there? Well, at eight, we start the service at 11, so if you want to be there to set up, you should be there when? 10-ish. I, don't, I think the park opens at 10-ish. So if you want to come, set up, help us. Now, the one thing that is on the list over there is there's food and all that kind of stuff, but there's one thing that we forgot. We need some gentlemen to be in charge of starting the fire, doing the grilling. So um, if anybody really wants to do that, see me afterwards, and we can probably put a, a crew together of guys that can make sure that starts and we get food that's not rare, but not too well done. Make sense? That's why I, when people say, if you go to somebody's house and you notice if I ever come to your house for barbecue or anything like that, I'll bring a hot dog to cook. You know why? Because you can't screw up a hot dog. <laughs> it's already cooked. And if you overcook them, they're even better, right? So, all right, now we're talking about food. Um, grab your Bible, get to Isaiah 55. Uh, it, it, this chapter is... Um, like I told the people this morning, is that Melissa and I were sitting in the camper, we were doing our vacation thing, and she said, hey, listen to this. And she read Isaiah 55, and I said, well, I've been searching for a passage of Scripture that I want to preach to both services. That's a good one, honey. Um, 
So here we are in Isaiah 55. I, I love the fact that God's um, voice is many times Melissa's voice, right? So this is a chapter that calls all people, Jews and Gentiles, listen, to come to the Lord and know His grace. It's a call to move from the worldly or the spiritual thinking into truth. What do you mean spiritual thinking? You know, you know those guys who say that they're spiritual, right? I'm a spiritual person. Yeah, but you don't know Jesus. I'm a spiritual person. Yeah, but you're not born again. You're not regenerate. You're not, you don't know what it means to be truly filled with the Holy Spirit. You just think you're spiritual. This is a call. See, Israel had a special privilege of being the chosen race. But this chapter shows that God invites everyone, everybody, into a relationship with Him. See, the problem going on before I read, just a setting, is there was a lot of Israelites were in captivity in Babylon, and those guys, they were, they were in there, and so they said, well, hey, we're in Babylon, let's be like the Babylonians. Let's do the things they do, let's buy the things they buy, let's put our focus on the things they put their focus on, and then we'll be, what, part of the group, we'll be part of the in crowd. Um, hmm. They weren't even working on satisfying the right need. Does that sound like the world around us now? People chasing after this and chasing after that and trying to fulfill this need and fulfill this thing. The problem I have, though, is that there's Christians doing it, too. Many that claim to be believers, but there's also those that really are believers. And I, I, I wrote this, I see more and more that Christians are assimilating themselves into the world around them, and it's hard to tell the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. We're no longer living as strangers and aliens. We're living as them. So let's read this passage, Isaiah 55. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy, and eat. Look at the exclamation point. That's in the original language. Come, buy, eat. Eat! Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. And I will make with you an everlasting covenant my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples and a leader and a commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know and a nation that, you, that did not know you shall run to you because the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Verse 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Heard that verse before? For as the heavens are higher than the earth, and so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And then he goes on in verse 10. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, like the rain that came down this morning did not go back up into heaven, right? It made a lake out here in the back. But now that's really disappeared. It's, it's, it's sunken down into the ground, and there'll be more grass there to mow. Giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace, and the mountains and hills before you shall break forth in singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and, the, and it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. All right. So I got some questions for you this morning. And hopefully I'm going to give you the answers right from God's Word. You okay with that? So first one, are you thirsty? What's the answer? Come to the Lord. Are you thirsty? Come to the Lord. Verse, uh, verse 1. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. 
Everybody's thirsting for something. Thirst, it's a real sense of need. I've got a real longing. I've got a real need. I've got a thirst for this. Whether it's right or wrong, I've got a thirst for it, right? Ideally, when we think of thirsting, we think of Jesus' words in Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. That's true. There comes a time when some people will give up chasing their thing, and they'll follow Jesus, and they'll accept Jesus, and be saved. They'll, they'll come, they'll indicate that they're repentant, and they're placing their faith in Jesus for salvation. All that really is needed for salvation is to come. Because the act of coming is coming in repentance. I stink. I need forgiveness. I'm going to go or come to the Lord in repentance and in faith. Come. Come. Here's the thing, though. Most of us are thirsty even now. We're saved, but we tend to go someplace else other than the Lord to satisfy our needs. Why is sometimes the last thing we do is pray? How, some, how come sometimes one of the last things we do is actually go to His Word and search out an answer? Why do we try to solve things ourselves? Thirsty. Sometimes it's the pull of your habit. Or the pull of the world is strong. And you've yet to resist the devil and give in to what the Lord has for you instead of what you desire from the world. Sometimes we resist for a period of time and then we get so tired of trying to resist in our own strength that we just give up and just live like the world. Am I reading your mail or just mine? So what are you trying to satisfy your thirst with? See, anything that doesn't include God's Word, doesn't include prayer, and doesn't include going to church and being part of something, anything other than that is you're trying to satisfy your desires, your, your needs, your wants with something else. Now look at this, it says, Come, everyone who thirsts. Come to the waters, plural waters. It means there's an abundance of water, an abundance of blessing ready. John says, uh, Jesus says in John 7, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Okay, so if I'm going to Jesus and I'm drinking of what he has to offer me, out of my heart will flow what? What's it say? Living waters. What does that mean, flowing living waters out of my heart? That means when I speak, I'll be glorifying the Lord. When I serve, I'll be glorifying the Lord. And when I do, do anything, it'll bring glory to the Lord, right? So what happens if we're not doing that? If, we're not, if living waters aren't flowing out because we don't look like a believer, we don't live like a believer, we don't even smell like a believer... That means we're thirsty. That means we've been filling up at the wrong water fountain. We need to go to the right water fountain. God not only gives water, though, it says here. It says, And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Picture of salvation. Salvation doesn't cost anything. True satisfaction found in the Lord doesn't cost anything. Why wine and milk? I see water, it's life-giving, I need that, but wine and milk? Okay, wait. Milk might what? Might bring what? A sustaining and, and nourishment. Like water is a picture of life. Milk is a picture of nourishment and sustaining. But what's wine? What? Joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord, because when he says wine is a picture of joy. It's, it's enjoying the Lord's presence, enjoying your relationship with the Lord. So salvation isn't like, I'm going to walk around the rest of my life like this. Okay? 
We can walk around as a follower of Jesus Christ with our head held high and a smile on our face. We're going to heaven, are you? So spiritual blessings are what are, are what pictured here. See, God willingly gives what is needed to satisfy the deepest of needs. What is your deepest of need? Every one of us, the same deepest of need is to be saved to be in right relationship with Jesus Christ, to have the peace of God that passes all understanding, to know that we're heading to heaven. You can't buy that. It's not for sale. You can't get it with money or good works. No amount of money or stuff is going to fill this void. It's a gift from God. We've talked about this over and over and over again through our Roman study, right? We can't buy salvation. We can't buy true joy. Can't be found anywhere. But look at verse 2. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in rich food. That which is not bread. Well, here, once you buy this piece of bread for me, it'll really satisfy you. Then you go to bite it and it's what? Stale, dry, dead we got a whole basement full of plastic food. Okay? Your kids like my plastic food. Okay? It's just, all the kids love it. And the biggest game with my kids and all the way up is you go and you eat this fake plastic food. Oh, it's good, isn't it? Here, have another slice of fake plastic pizza. Oh, okay. No. I used to fool some of my kids. I won't tell you which one was dumb enough to fall for it. Okay? used to just put the food all down my shirt and say, where is it? Where is it? And they couldn't figure out where it was, and I'd pull my shirt. And... Fake, fake, fake. Don't spend money on things. Don't spend time on things that have no possibility of satisfying your need for forgiveness and your peace with God. Just for a minute, go over to John chapter 6. Verse 22. It says, on the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. It's talking about feeding the 5,000. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, um, hmm, huh, when did you come here? And Jesus said to them, <clears throat> Truly, truly, I say to you, you're seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Here's a good verse. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, for on him God has set his seal. I think Jesus is remembering Isaiah 55 here. Then he said to them, what must, then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God. And Jesus said, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who has sent. So they said, then, what sign do you do? What sign do you do? He just fed 5,000 people. What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I love this, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Who's that? Jesus, right? They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. And you guys can read the rest of John chapter 6. It's all basically the same thing. What's the bread that we buy without price? It's Jesus. True satisfaction. So remember at the time, these Israelites were spending all kinds of their money and their labor on things of the world. They were, igno they were ignoring God. They might, be, they might have thought that they were seeking true joy and true happiness or contentment, but they weren't. God's saying, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? This I offer, 
And this you fight, you're chasing after. This dissolves into dust. This is perfect and forever and eternal. I read this this week. Worldly things can never satisfy the heart, not even the heart of the worldly. I also read this from 100 years ago, from a commentary in 1910. Hank, you weren't alive then, but just barely missed it. <laughs> 100 years ago. Listen to this. It's kind of long, but it's like you wrote it yesterday. You ready? Most men's history is a long series of disappointments. The boy desires freedom from restraint, and you have his time at his own disposal, but no sooner does he obtain his wish than time hangs heavy on his hands, and he does not know what to do with it. The best love amusement does not please for long. The pleasures of eating and drinking, Paul, P-A-L-L, that means loss of ability to satisfy an appetite. I had to look it up. Drunkenness and excess are found to have attached to them an overplus of painful sensation. The praise of men, distinction, fame, when they have been enjoyed for a short time, appear worthless. Wealth, comfort, ease equally fail to satisfy. Men labor as a general rule during the greater part of their lives for that which satisfieth not. From Isaiah 55, only a fortunate few learn, listen, early to set their affections on objects of different character. Heavenly objects are satisfying. He that drinks of the water of life which Christ supplies thirsts no more. Thirst no more. John 4.14 the heavenly things do not pass away, they remain. The water that Christ gives us becomes in us a well of water springing up to everlasting life. Again, from John 4:14. 4, God's favorable regard, God's peace, God's blessing are eternally, eternal objects of desire, and their possession is happiness. He who has them needs nothing more, desires nothing more, finds them sufficient for him, nor in his state one of mere pass, nor is this state one of mere passive acquiescences, acqui and whatever that word, that that one. His soul is delighted with fatness. He enters into the joy of the Lord. Nineteen ten, that was written. See, the only thing that can truly satisfy, listen, is to respond positively to the invitation: "Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters." That is the only thing that truly satisfies us in life. So here's another question. Moving on. Are you tired? Are you tired? Here's the answer. Listen to the Lord's call. Verse 3. Well, you start, basically, you start in the second part of verse 2. Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Rich food. So listening to the Lord gives you what is good. And it gives you rich food. Rich food. Not just the cheap stuff. We're talking about the good stuff. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your what? Soul may what? Live. Are you tired? And I'll make an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Are you tired of your own ways? Are you trying to do life without a close relationship with the Lord? Are you just going through life and you're just plain old tired? I would say most of the time. Remember though, we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit if we're saved. The enabler, the comforter, the helper. You think maybe he can help you in your mundane world, your mundane job? You think so? I think so. You know, he might have helped you get through that wall, that hole you had to drill yesterday. <laughs> Is it done? Is the hole through? Good. You see, I think Christians forget, forget, forget that close relationship that we have with the Lord. God's saying, don't be stupid. Come. Come. 
Come to the waters so that your soul may live. That's the gospel. So that your soul may live. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Do you preach the gospel to yourself? Do you remind yourself of the truth that Jesus Christ died for you, you are forgiven, and you have the ticket to get into heaven? The writer says, eat what is good. Delight yourself in rich food. Eat what is good. Eat what is good? I mean, bacon's good. <coughs> Cheeseburger is good. Uh-uh. Listen diligently to me. Listen diligently to me. How do we listen to the Lord? How do we know what rich food is? What is rich food? This is better than any filet mignon. Okay? Better than any loaded pizza. No. Okay. Your soul may live. That's salvation. That's hope for the future. So I came up with this first thing this morning. Lord kind of laid this on me. You ready for it? RPA. You need to remember the, the just, just RPA. Not RCA, RPA. Ready? Read, pray, and attend. Read, pray, and attend. That's how we listen to the Lord. That's how we get over being tired. We read God's Word, we pray to the Lord, and we what? Attend church small group, whatever gathering that we can possibly get at, that is what feeds our heart, feeds our soul that we may live. How many of you guys, I'm not looking at you, Martins, how many of you guys have gone through times where you haven't been in church for a while and you realize that it drains the, what? the life out of your soul? I'm just saying what the Bible says, okay? See, let's move on a little bit. See, covenants. God's made lots of covenants with men, and men have broken those covenants, haven't they, over time? But there's a covenant in 2 Samuel 7 that's called the everlasting covenant. What is that covenant? God says to David, David, one of your offspring will be on the throne forever. It's an everlasting covenant. Who's David's offspring? Jesus, who sits on the throne forever and ever and ever? Jesus. That's an everlasting covenant. So when you read the rest of this, it says, Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know shall run to you, because the Lord your God of the Holy One of Israel has glorified you. It's all speaking of Jesus Promises that God made David about the Messiah. First promise. So all these are all in Psalms. He would come from David's offspring. He'd sit on a throne everlasting and have an everlasting kingdom. Two, he would triumph over death and hell. Three, he would give peace and happiness to Israel and to the rest of the world. Jesus came to bear truth and to lead sinners to freedom. Jesus is the one we serve. He's our commander. Jesus came to save sinners, right? And Jesus is the one that God glorified. So you're tired? Listen to the Lord's call. Listen to what the Lord has for you. So many times we need a little boost, right? I need a cup of coffee more than once in a day. Maybe I need this more than once in a day. Right? Maybe I need to pray more than once a day. Maybe I need to attend more than once a week. You see? So Melissa says to me, make sure you know that, to make sure you tell everybody that Wednesday night is open. Come, come. We gather, we talk, we, we, we're, we're in God's Word, we pray together on Wednesday nights. It's right here. If it's hot, we turn the AC on, right? If it's cold, we shiver. 
No, I won't be cold. All right, let's look at this last question. I can answer yes to this first question. Are you confused? Mm, yep. What's the answer? It's right there in verse 6. Seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. Are you confused? Seek the Lord. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Think, think, seek the Lord while he's near. Seek the Lord. Don't seek anything else. You want a spiritual blessing? Seek the Lord. Call on the Lord. We read in Romans that Romans uh, 10, if you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. Call. You confused? And it says here, let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man his thoughts. See the wicked. When you, when you think of wicked, who are they? The obvious sinner, okay? The wicked, he does things people see, and we would call him wicked. The language is a little different, though, when we start talking about the unrighteous dude, or dudette. Unrighteous. What's that mean? How about this up here? This is not wired right. You start thinking things you shouldn't be thinking. You start you know, thinking about how I'm going to do this and all that, and you're just thinking, well, I don't like that person. Yeah. What did Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount? If you think it, you did it. So who's, who's, who's more of a sinner, the prodigal son or the older brother? Both. One is obvious, out there in public, he did everything he could, squandered his wealth, partied hardy, and ate with pigs. Okay? Older brother, he stayed home. He took care of the family business. A little self-righteousness there, right? Maybe a little jealousy of what the other one got to do. We don't know what was going on inside the, the, the older brother. So you got the unrighteous and you got the wicked, both just as sinful. He says, Let him return, verse, last part of verse 7, let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion, that the Lord may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Oh my goodness. Hmm. Return to the Lord. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the Israelites. This was before salvation. This was before Jesus Christ. He's talking to the Israelites, and he's saying, return, return to me. God says return after all those Israelites' stupid moves and stupid sinful things. He says return. In the New Testament, God calls us to confess and repent and receive forgiveness over and over and over again. Not just one and done, it's all the time. God will abundantly pardon. It means to multiply to pardon. You know, you know God's grace better the closer you are to Him. The more and more you get to know the Lord, you understand His grace. The more He's forgiven you. The unsaved can turn to the Lord for forgiveness and salvation. The saved have to turn to the Lord over and over again for, for forgiveness. It's not a one, some, you know, when I got saved at eight years old, I'm now 56 years old. What's the math there? It's a long time. Okay? Do you think that just because I was saved at eight years old, all of my sins have been forgiven all the way up through? Yes, positionally. But relationship-wise with the Lord, you need to seek forgiveness so that that relationship stays close and gets closer with the Lord. See, verse 8 and 9 are popular verses. Let's read them. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Wow, that's a great verse. Let's go home. What's it mean? 
These verses always build on the previous verses, right? So the previous statement is, God will abundantly pardon. Never ever doubt God's willingness to pardon your sin. Even if actions and thoughts seem unforgivable, God will forgive your sin. Why? His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Because what are your thoughts if somebody offends you? Right? You with me? Like, forget you. And you move on. How about the idea that, you know, somebody might be saying, well, I'm a Christian, but that guy over there, God will never forgive him. What? What? Okay? You hear me? God will abundantly pardon. And what he's saying, don't worry. If you screwed up, come back to me. Come back to me. Come back to me. Any parent in this room would say, come back, come back. Right? He's saying, come back. God forgives. God grants salvation. God's plans and His purposes are far beyond what we can even imagine. It's true in so many ways. Who would have ever thought up salvation the way it, ha- way it happens? Do you guys know what heaven's going to be like? We don't. When we get there, we're going to go, why did you wait so long to bring me here? Okay? God's ways are holy and just. God's ways are laid out for us in His Word. God's ways are taught to us by His Spirit. God's going in a direction. He's not aimlessly wandering like we do. He's bringing us to a point. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. What's that mean? Here's the straight path. And Bill should be going this way. But what happens to Bill? Bill goes this way sometimes. Goes way off this way. And then God says, no, go back over here. Okay? Because I'm trying to focus on the Lord. He's going to make sure that my path's straight. You know, if I'm riding my motorcycle and my eyes are forward, where am I going? Forward. If my eyes go off that way, where am I going? That way. Isaac came home the other night. He had whacked his hand. Okay? Okay? With his hammer. And he says, you know what I was thinking about just before I did that? I said, yeah, you were thinking that you were going to whack your hand. Because where your mind is, where your eyes go, therefore goes the hammerhead. Okay? If you're thinking it, don't look at it. Because if you're thinking it and you look at it, you're going to hit it. God's ways are straight ahead. He'll get you where you need to be. You see, the thing is, we can know God's thoughts. We can know His ways. We can know what He wants us to know. Why? Verse 10, For as the rain and snow come down from the heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making the, it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth that shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and it shall succeed in the thing which I sent it. Dry ground, desert, rain comes, plant grows. That's the illustration. The application is hard heart, hard soul, hard messed up. God's word comes through the gospel originally, through his word, through prayer, through attending church, and my hard heart becomes soft and grows. Rain and snow come down and water the earth. Give life to dry ground. God's word comes and gives life to the dry soul. And I don't care if it's pre-salvation or after salvation. You can have a dry soul that needs his word. And in verses 12 and 13, are just, they're just joy. And God's going to deliver us. He delivered the, the, the Israelites from Babylonian captivity. He's originally going to deliver us from this planet that we live in, either when we die or when there's some rapture or when it all comes to an end. But there'll be a new heaven and a new earth, and that will be the time of joy. All right, just thinking. Wrapping it up. When you get home tonight, today, and you think back, what was that sermon about? 
or tomorrow morning you wake up, I can't remember that sermon. You don't have to go to Facebook and look at it, okay? Just think about these three words. Come, listen, and seek. The message of the whole Bible. The message of the whole Bible is come, all you who are thirsty. In Revelation twenty two seventeen, 17, the Spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who, who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. It's all through the Bible, Isaiah 55, all through the Gospels, even in the last chapter of the Bible, it says, come. Listen to the Lord. Say, come, listen. Listen to what? His word, his spirit in prayer, and his people. Just remember, RPA. RPA, what is it? What's the first one? Read. Second one? Pray. Third one? Is that not the answer to life? Okay, isn't it? Last one, seek. I left this verse for last. Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and what? All these what? All these things shall be added unto you. Everything you need will be given to you. As the Lord cares for the sparrow, he cares for you. Lord, help us. And I just pray that you would do an amazing thing again with the words I spoke, like I pray a lot. Change whatever I said wrong and make it right when, people, when it lands in people's hearts. Lord, that, that we may know you and know the power of your word, that we may come to you and that we may get our soul's thirst satisfied only in you. Lord, that we would not wander away, but that we would stay in the best possible, closest relationship with you that we can have. Lord, that you may use us, that we may serve you, that we may see some mighty things happen. Lord, I pray for those that are thirsty today, that you would absolutely meet them and bring them to the waters. Lord, you are amazing, you are holy, and we surrender to you. In Jesus' name, amen. He's calling you. If you seek him, he, you'll find he's always been there. Just waiting for you to come and receive the gift of mercy and love that he's been waiting to pour on you. Think of that poem, The Footprints in the Sand, where there was just one set of footprints and you look back and realize they weren't yours, they were Jesus carrying you.
Lord, let this be our prayer, that we listen for your call and that we thirst after you and that we continuously seek after your love and mercy and know that you are always there in every moment.